Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you Hi. are feeling revived after your plant-based snack and <laughs> industrial amounts of caffeine. Um, I'm Marion Hume, the international fashion editor of the Australian Financial Review. Australia being a key source of fashion's raw luxuries, not least, of course, wool. Fashion's front line can be very far from the front row. Your Saint Laurent skirt, your Uniqlo sweater might begin thousands of miles from here on a sheep in the Australian outback. Fashion begins as an agricultural business. But before we meet those who are going to take us down on the farm, just to say what this is not about, we are not here to talk about fur. Whatever opinion you brought into this room on fur is the opinion that you're likely to leave with. What we are here to talk about is the welfare of animals across fashion supply chain. Sheep for wool, goats for cashmere, cattle, rabbits, camels. Uh, there was mention of a yak earlier. Let's just see where our panelists want to go. And so, to meet them. Uh, Dr. Helen Crowley is based in Paris, is the head of, sustain of sustainable sourcing innovation at Caring, the luxury group that you now know all about. While the brands that she works for may include Bottega Veneta, McQueen, etc., you are likely to find Helen, who is a scientist, in her hiking boots, examining the supply chain of leather across the African continent or working out of a Gur tent in Mongolia, assessing the impact of rising herd numbers of Kashmir goats. The first of our three experts, Helen knows Helen has a true understanding of the impact of fashion, which goes all the way to Gucci, but may start with herders making sure that the pens where they keep their goats at minus 35 degrees don't get overfilled with goat shit. Well, Simon, you asked us to get down and dirty. <laughs> Lorraine Pepper is from Borden County, Texas, and is the managing director of Textile Exchange. She comes from a farming factory, a family, sorry. She comes from a cotton farming family, was driving a tractor by her early teens, and realized very early that the aerial spraying of millions of acres and the planting of genetically modified seed might not be the best way forward. Her knowledge therefore extends from bollworms to Balenciaga. As she has stated, the difference between conventional, chemically intensive agriculture and organic is now quite literally life or death. Philip Limbury is the chief executive of Compassion in World Farming, and he comes to us from rural England with a very simple aim. He wants to end factory farming within a generation. He has worked extensively on animal welfare for 25 years and is the author of books including Farmageddon, The True Cost of Cheap Meat, which begs the question, what is he doing at a fashion summit? And so, to find out, Helen, first to you. We talk a lot about transparency. We know now to ask who made my clothes and to hashtag that, but we tend to draw a veil over where things actually begin. How important is the farm to fashion? Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, everybody. It's lovely to be here. Um, the farm is actually essential. It's not just the farm, it's the forests, it's the mines. We are actually a primary productivity industry. We base all of our products on things that come from the land. Today, we're going to focus much more on agriculture. And the reason I can say that with such certainty is because of our environment profit and loss account, which you heard about this morning from Monsieur Pino, the CEO of Caring. So we rolled out this environment profit and loss account um, in 2015, and it shows very clearly 93% of our impacts are in our supply chain. But more importantly, 70% of those impacts are actually at raw materials. It's how we grow our leather, it's how we grow our wool, it's how we grow our cotton, it's where our, where does our raw materials, where do our raw materials come from? So this is a really important place to focus attention if we want to talk about being sustainable, or actually let's talk about even going beyond sustainable to being regenerative and restorative as an industry, as a company, as an individual buyer, and as an industry. So this farm, this focus 
on where does our stuff come from is super, super important. And understanding what we can leverage there is even more important. Now, that doesn't mean that other actions through the supply chain aren't essential. Of course they are. But when you think about 70% of your raw of your impacts as a company are at raw materials, and that in fact over 70% of the Earth's surface is transformed into some sort of landscape that's for a production purpose. If we really do want to contribute to saving the world, we've got that's our playing area. That's where we've got to look. What can we leverage to make that a more restorative, regenerative place to be? And so with our animal welfare standards that we've just released, as well as our supplier standards, which we've which are public also, we're shining a light, quite a, a big light, on that part of our supply chain and sort of entering into a, a place where we've got to start uh, discussing, not as a, just as a company, but with everybody, okay, what do we need to leverage? What can we change to make this better at this part of our supply chain? It's not easy because as also as Mr. Pino said this morning, this is outside of our ownership of the supply chain, but it's where we're... Um, it's where we have to focus. It is also where we can leverage remarkable, remarkable change and very exciting stories, which we'll talk about later. So, Philip, over to you. I mean, how does your compassion impact fashion as opposed to farming? I mean, why should the people in this room from Inditex Zara or H&M or Primark, why should they pay attention? Well, the welfare of animals in food and fibre production is inextricably linked, and it's a hallmark of, of the, 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 the civilization that we, we live in, you know, the ethical nature of that. And I think that leaders in the fibre industry, as well as the food industry, are uh, listening to their consumers and understanding uh, the aspirations of consumers and taking a leadership stance. Uh, that animal welfare matters to their business and hats off to caring for their newly launched animal welfare standards. But, you know, it goes even further than that. The welfare of animals impacts on the future of our environment and of us too as people. Uh, the way that we keep animals in factory farms, which is the way most animals are kept, has a big bearing on climate change and on the environment. And time is running out. We as a, as a society are facing a global crisis. It's been mentioned a number of times here, but you know, let's just roll it out. Let's spell it out. Scientists recently have told us that we've got 12 years to solve climate change. Not to talk about how, but to solve it. At the same time, bees and other pollinators that are essential for the very existence of a third of all our food and some fibre are falling off a cliff. At the same time, antibiotics, half of which across the world are used in farming to prop up largely the, the diseases of factory farming, could soon stop working. Then if we look to the seas, we can see that within 30 years it's expected that fish stocks, wild fish stocks, could be exhausted. And then if the UN uh, is to be believed, if we continue as we are, they warn we've got 60 harvests left in our soils. And then what? No food, no fibre that has grown from the land. So that is why we have to recognize that actually sustainability is good and it's wonderful that this conference is embracing that and has talked so much about it so far. But actually, there's a new game in town. Sustainability is rapidly going out of fashion because that's about doing tomorrow what we can do today. With increasing demand, more people and reduced resources, and a shrinking timeline, we can see that our food and our fibre has to move to a way of production that is regenerative, that is putting back into nature's asset bank. And we need to do that for animal welfare, for protection of the environment, for ourselves in this room and our companies, for the future of our children. And we need to do it now by, this, by everything you're saying. Lorraine, over to you. I mean, cotton isn't an animal. Um, so why, why are you here? Tell us more about the sort of broader awareness of biodiversity and how that connects with our fashion business. So many of the fibres that we have, whether it's cotton or wool or cashmere or 
linen or hemp or land-based fibers. So in that way, the clothes that we wear become a tool to address this, the issues and the fa- things that we're facing by choosing more sustainable. We actually like to use the word preferred, where we're crossing a threshold from actually doing less harm to moving to a situation where we're actually doing, delivering positive impacts through regenerative agriculture, yeah. through better practices on animal welfare, exercising the five freedoms. That's addressing food security, biodiversity. There's so many holistic solutions that can be delivered simply by choosing more responsible organic and regenerative fibers, whether they're you know, cellulosic-based or animal welfare-based. Philip, coming back to you, I mean, is, is the elephant in the room as far as animal welfare actually not really an elephant, but millions of goats, millions of sheep? Isn't the kindest thing we can all do is not to use animals at all and therefore not to have animals? I mean, how can you, is that where you want this to go? Well, Marion, you've got a point there. We do have far too many farm animals uh, being produced in the world for food and for fiber, uh, leather, wool, and so on. Uh, And if we're going to have a genuinely future-proof system of production, then we need to reduce the numbers probably by about half. If we reduce the number by half, then we can keep those animals on the pastures, on the margins, feeding them with food waste that can't otherwise be reduced, feeding them with genuine agricultural byproducts in a way which adds to our you know, a global asset bank rather than takes away. And why is that imperative? Well, if we continue as we are, just you know, rearing more and more farm animals every year and eating them and wearing them willy-nilly, scientists tell us that by the middle of the century, our food and fibre alone could trigger catastrophic climate change. No need, no contribution needed from the energy sector. So it's that important. Mm. Helen, you know, you're you're both a scientist, but also, as we can see, very much one of us in the fashion world. (laughs) Just just really spell it out to us what the risks are to those of us who would just happily remain within our fashion bubble and not really think about the countryside. Um, Okay, wow, that's a, okay, big ask. Let me try and be (laughs) succinct. So the, um, it's so much more comfortable in the bubble I mean, it's so much more comfortable when you're in your own zone. You can talk to people in the same language. Everyone understands you. And I don't mean that by different language. I mean, the way that we talk, the words we use in, in, in what we do in fashion. and it's, it, or, or other areas. I spent many, many years of my career in the NGO world, in sustainable development and conservation. And, and you're surrounded by people that think like you, that, that talk like you, and so on. But, and we're naturally tribal. Humans are. So we've got to break out of that, because we're not going to do it on our our own as individuals as individual sectors we have to share knowledge and ideas and we have to we have no choice i mean i've been in this business in this conservation business for i'm not going to say very lo- how long cuz it it's a long time and i feel a certain respons- personal responsibility to the fact in that time we have lost 60% of the species on the planet so we don't actually have a choice. We've got to move out of our bubble. We're going to say, okay, what can we do that we're really, really good at? Um, what can we leverage? And how can we talk to others about working together and not reinvent the world? And is it, is it NGOs? Is it, is it other sectors like the food sector, and the investment sector? Let's talk more about the solutions and the outcomes that we want. We have the solutions. We want to talk about the outcomes. We want soil regenerated. We want animals treated respectfully. We need less animals. We need farming communities that are vibrant. And, and happy and healthy. That's what we all agree on. So let's chart the way forward. And we in the fashion world can be part of that, a really exciting part of that. Uh, so I think that, yes, the bubble's comfy, but nothing changes when you're comfortable. Change only happens when you're uncomfortable. So, so from, from discomfort to let's go to something positive. Lorraine, tell us about textile standards and how they can actually add a give us a positive way forward. Absolutely. Ultimately, we all have a choice. Um, The fact that we can have 
safe drinking water anywhere in Denmark didn't happen by default. Yeah. It happened by design because there's a set of best practices. The same is true when we're talking about animal fibers and the five freedoms of animals and the importance of, of the contribution that they make, not just about animal welfare, but the social piece, the fact that we're protecting indigenous cultures, the fact that through rotational grazing and responsible grazing, we're reducing desertification. And so by... When I make a choice, last week, um, I bought my son a down jacket that had the responsible down standard. As a consumer, that gives me confidence that I'm purchasing a product that is part of the solution rather than blindly purchasing something that is part of the problem. So that's ultimately what consumers mm. have to do. And Philip, I'm going to circle back to you, because Philip and I actually literally met for the first time about one minute ago. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Are you vegan? I am, personally, yes. So, as I'm not, I mean, first of all, should we have a fight up here about animals? But is, is vegan the answer? I mean, is your job to convert me? Is that going to kind of make this all better? Well, Marion, the good news for you is that that's not the reason why I'm here. Whilst I think that, uh, you know, it's a great step for people to take to, to go vegan, um, that a, a few people going vegan uh, is, is a good thing. What is much, much better is all of us, or at least most of us, uh, choosing to reduce our meat and dairy consumption, choosing wisely about, for example, the wool and the leather that we, that we wear, uh, and making sure that uh, you know, we, we have less of it, and that we make sure that it's from better treated animals in uh, regenerative systems. Let uh, me actually, I'm going to interrupt you, because I'm, I'm thinking of wool at this point, and yeah. uh, thinking how Britain's Prince Charles, who is also Australia's Prince Charles, um, <laughs> campaigns for wool, which he regards as a miracle fibre because it has longevity, it's breathable, obviously he doesn't do his own laundry. Um, but is, Helen, is, is wool the answer? Well, you're sort of asking the wrong person because I love wool and I actually love washing wool. I actually do. I love the smell of oh, wool. Oh, send mine round then. But caveat here, I'm a Tasmanian. <laughs> So um, it sort of comes with the territory, literally. Uh, where, that's where some of the best wool in the world comes from. And I was actually recently just there meeting with the wool growers. And so on the one hand, yeah, wool is a miracle fiber. If you don't like washing it, well, now we've got these amazing different wool fabrics that are just phenomenal. So there's a lot of great things about wool. And when I actually spent time in the Antarctic, sub-Antarctic, and they used to give you, many years ago, it was wool that they gave you to wear. Granted, you have Gore-Tex jackets as well. But, so I think wool is a miracle fibre. But more importantly, it, what I've seen, having visited a lot of farms in Australia, is how it can be a driver for positive change. That we, all of what we've been talking about. Like when, when white people first settled Australia, they talked about the fact the soil was spongy. Now, I don't know how many people have been to Australia, but you don't think of spongy soil. When you're out there, you think of like really hard soil. And it's basically been too much grazing and uh, climate change has played a, a role in that too. But when you go to a regenerative farm and you go to a farm where they're managing the way they're moving their animals around, the soil actually is spongy. You actually feel it. It's remarkable. And there are farmers out there that are looking at conservation easements, protecting woodlands, um, protecting the grasslands in central Tassie, of which only 5% of natural grasslands left. And so the, 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 the switch you're starting to see in the way wool is produced, the way the animals are treated, the way the, um, the land is being stewarded is really remarkable. So that's the miracle bit, as much as I love. So wear wool wear. is a big message here. Yeah. Um, Don't give me Simon all asked us at the friends. beginning, <laughs> to, uh, we asked all of us to think of ways that we could win. I'm not sure I think that saving the planet is a game show, but if we were watching TV and we had to have a takeaway, obviously not served in single-use plastic, I'd, leech, I'd like to ask each of you for a kind of takeout that the audience can have. So one thing that they can take away and they can do, because you're all in agreement, of course, we have to be nice to animals and we have to save the world, but make it can we make it a bit easy? So, Helen, I'm going to come to you first. What is the one thing everyone in this room can do to make things a bit better? OK. Um, so, I'm a scientist, so I'm all about facts. And, and I really 
believe in the power of facts, but as we heard earlier today, facts aren't everything. And what I have found, and they can be twisted and so on. So what I've found is one of the most powerful things that gets to people is stories and storytelling. And I think that what we need to get better, because all of you in this room by definition are experts and, and know about sustainability and fashion or different aspects of it. I think we have to be as informed as we possibly can and we have to go out and be better storytellers to our friends, to our family. Okay, so tell world. stories. I'm moving you fast because I can see the time's ticking. Philip, one thing that you can convert me to oh, do yeah. and you have one minute to tell me. Well, I'm out of my natural habitat here because I'm normally amongst food people and food companies. So fashion is something new for me. And thank you so much for, for uh, looking after me today on the stage and calling out my dietary requirements. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 I think the, the, the big thing that, the, that people in the fashion industry can do is to show leadership. Uh, and I think to, to put it into a single sentence, leadership to ensure that the future of leather is on grass. Leather uh, on grass. Yeah. But the future Hooray. of leather is on grass. Over to you. Indeed. What can I do? What can we all do? Well, if you're a business, I think you need to realize that you get what you pay for. So it's time to make investments in responsible and regenerative agricultural products. And the current system has created the poverty and the pollution we have. And the thing that I would leave for consumers and, and for you personally is that if you want to change the world, you need to change your socks. Hang on, change the world, change my socks. Is that <laughs> now? It's very simple. <laughs> change, yes. just so we've, we've actually got one more minute. Tell me how by changing my socks. That's the simplest thing we've heard, heard all day. We can all do that, but how's that going to make a difference? Well, when you're buying socks made from certified and preferred materials, it sends down that message all the way back to the farm gate level to make sure you're implementing those regenerative practices, that you're treating your animals fairly, that you're treating your people fairly. And one of the most important ways we can reduce climate uh, risk and mitigate that risk is by putting soil first and making sure we're putting carbon back into our soils. So when you buy those socks, you're sending a clear market message that comes all the way back to me as a farmer. Can I just So the story the we have to tell is yeah. change our socks. We're yeah. run out of time. And tell the story. It's not what your socks say about you. It's what you can say about your exactly. socks. Exactly. It's what yeah. you can tell, say. Yeah, not, story. not what, say that again. Not what your socks say about you. It's about what you can say about your socks. So ask tell not what your country can do for you, yeah. but what your <laughs> socks can Something do for the like planet. That. On right. that we end. Thank you Thank very, you. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.